little while since I've been in church. I grew up in, in church, so, and so when I came in, I did feel right at home. Um, so today, I'm not going to preach to y'all. My father was a preacher. I could never amount to his preaching, and so I've decided to do the best I can to avoid preaching at all costs. So I'm going to continue with that. But my father, whenever he would speak, he, he stuck by the five B's. Be brief, brother. Be brief. And so, on this morning, as you know, God is shining over in San Antonio. I don't want to hold it all up for this game tonight. I want to thank Reverend McBride for having me, First Lady, Sister Cherise, for allowing me to come here this morning. Uh, it means a lot to me. It means an awful lot to me. I, I take it with um, great pride and humility to be able to stand in your pulpit and stand and hear you. Um, ever since I met Reverend McBride over the phone, he's been something that most people are not, a man of his work. And um, he is stuck by me, and I'm looking forward to us doing some amazing things in this world together. So, and, I, and I honor and respect this opportunity to be here before y'all. Um, before I start, before I start, I wanna I wanna sing a little bit of a song because it soothes me a little bit. My dad used to love this song. Okay. I've had some good days. All right now. And I've had some hills, hills to climb. I've had some weary days. And some lonely nights. Yes, but when I look around,
fathers that have no care for their children. It's not deadbeat fathers that don't pay their child support. It's not fathers that have children out of wedlock and are gone. It's very simply a system that since the beginning of our trek from our mother country to here has sought to destroy the very fabric of our family. Yes, sir. Yes. See, there's one myth that fatherhood is just simply, it simply operates in a vacuum. It is a part of a fabric. It is a part of a tapestry of the backbone of a community. <coughs> and there is a system in this country that seeks to eradicate the very notion of fatherhood in our community. Yes. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so today I won't preach to y'all, but I hope to teach you a little bit, a little bit, about mass incarceration. Yes. Amen. Since we came here, trapped in the bottom and the bowels of ships, black people and their family structure has been destroyed. We all know this. Fathers were separated from families, mothers were separated from husbands, children separated from their parents, all in a concerted attempt to ensure that we remain as a community powers. Mm -hmm. yeah. The system isn't broken, it was designed right. this way. Right. Mm -hmm. And so for President Obama on Father's Day of 2008 to stand before a black congregation and extol us about how black people need to step up is only a half truth. Mm -hmm. Because we stand under the full gravity of a system working quite well. And so even after we survived the middle passage to America, we survived our families being separated, we survived seeing our wives being taken by the slave master, we survived the full brunt of the brutality of slavery, another system was put in place. And on Father's Day, when every article and post that you may read may ask the question, where are our black men? Yes. You know where they are. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> we have an opportunity to elevate an issue, yeah. a system, a concern called mass incarceration. Right. Yeah. Now, mass incarceration started 20 to 30 years ago during the war on drugs, which quite simply was a war on our communities. Right. Yeah. See, another myth is that the black father was never present. Statistics show that black fathers are the, the most involved when they have the opportunity to be involved in any racial group in the country. Yeah. African American fathers are more likely to be stay-at-home fathers. African American fathers are the most philanthropic. African American men are most likely to serve in the army. That's something that you get excited about. So when people talk about the African American male and the African American father and the Latino father in this country, that's not the story we know. And so we've got to take it upon ourselves on these opportunities to celebrate ourselves operating under a flourishing system. My father always used to say, write the vision, make it plain. <laughs> and so today, we cannot operate anymore <clears throat> under deficiency. We must come together under a vision of the future for our community. <clears throat> There's a war going on outside on our fathers, on our brothers, on our sons. Mass incarceration has swept even through the, the state of California. Yes, sir. And the war that we're fighting is not by accident. Mm -hmm. We're talking about power. Mm -hmm. We're talking about a small group of people able to maintain power at the expense of another group. Amen. Yeah. And that disproportionately affects our men. So when people ask, where are all the men at? Why are there so many unmarried, black women in this country, the answer is not 
that we're lost, that we become disengaged with the black community, it's that we're locked up. Amen. It's that after you're locked up, you, are, you remain in a perpetual system of yes. incarceration. Yes. 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 After you leave the jail, you're on parole. Come on. Most paroles come with fees. Come on. You can be discriminated against in housing. So it doesn't, it doesn't matter whether you want to raise a family or provide a home for your family. You cannot because we live under a flourishing system. So you cannot find a home. So when people are asking where are black men, why are they not in the home, it's because our country has rendered them homeless. When people ask why are black men so lazy, we must bust that bit because after, even after you served your time in jail, on, you can be discriminated on job applications. So if I can't provide shelter for myself, mm -hmm. I can't provide a way to make ends meet for myself, come on, come on. what am I to do? And so then we have a system that is so corrupt, so morbidly genius that we made sure that the odds are stacked against our black men and our, our, our brothers, our, our nephews, and we, we say, if you can't find a job, you can't make ends meet, you better not be on that corner. And so we live in a society that not only relegates our young people to second-class citizenship, but vilifies them for trying to make ends meet. And so today, as we celebrate fatherhood, we celebrate the men that stepped up. We celebrate the men that flourished under a system. We must remember those that the odds are stacked against. We cannot let a country tell us that we're inherently bad. are genetically predisposed to crumble. We cannot allow a country on Father's Day to tell us that we don't even need to celebrate this day because none of us know who our fathers are. My father was a myth buster. He was there and he was invisible. There's no one, no one in this country sees a black father. Even today, my father, when I called him, didn't believe that he needed thanks hmm. or he deserved thanks. Wow. Not on this day. And so we must take this opportunity today to be mythbusters, to stand up against a nation that seeks to see us crumble, to stand up against a nation that seeks to hide away all of our brothers and sisters in the behind cell bars. Mm -hmm. We've got to stand up against a system that stacks the odds against our people. That's the work we're doing. That's why I'm here in Oakland. That's why I relish the opportunity to meet and to build with each of you, because our job must be mythbusters. Yes, the stories being told about our community are not real. I'm from Chicago. Every week you read an article about the killings in Chicago. Every week. But it's only part of the truth. Violence is only a sy symptom of poverty. Yeah. And when you have a population of people who are relegated to second class <coughs> citizenry, poverty, what are you going to get? We're going to get crime. And then we look at them like Frankenstein's monster. We made you, but you are ugly. We look at them like the worst of us. And we say they're predisposed to anger, to crime. It's a lie. It's a lie. It's a lie. And we have an opportunity here. We have an opportunity to tell a new story about our community starting with today. Tell a new story about our fathers. It's not just genetic. I had men take care of me and mentor me even now. 
supplement the work that my father did. I don't have any children of my own, but this morning I was reminded that the work that we do, the role that we play in society raises up people from the margins. And so starting today, we should tell a different story about our father. We should tell a different story about our community, knowing that we aren't to blame, that we operate under a system. Everybody knows what mass incarceration is. We may not call it that, but you know what it is. Everybody knows what the war on drugs is. We may call it something different, but we know what it is. And so it's time for us to stand up against it. Amen. It's time for us to protect our families. It's time for us to protect the very nation. We, we can be better than the story that is told about us. Yeah. It annoys me to no end to see black people perpetuate a lie. It's not always them. It's not always the others. The status is I bear for people from my community. And if for the few minutes that I have with you all today, we can work together to start to dispel those myths in our work, our work will not be in vain. The Dream Defenders in Florida are working with young people every day to get them to tell a new story about themselves. To get them to understand that you're not born a criminal. No one is born illegal. No one is born deep. No one in this country is born to be attacked. So we must tell a new story to our children. I've seen many times talking to young people how changing a few words that you use when you're talking about your father or your brothers or your sisters or your mothers can transform their outlook and their posture. So I hope to challenge all of us to tell a new story to our young people. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Don't tell the lies that this country tells about us. Yeah. Amen. Because I come from a stock of survivors. Huh. Yeah. We all come from a stock of survivors. Yeah. And so on behalf of our organization, our movement, all the way on the other side of the country, we come to you all in true solidarity for the future of our young people and our communities. I value the opportunity to be with you all today. I spoke from the heart. Somebody asked me earlier that I have a scripture and I felt a lot of pressure. And I could not. It's all right. <laughs> I get emotional talking about him because this, this world took away from him the very thing that every person deserves, their, their, their humanity. And I don't speak ill of my father, ever. <coughs> but when I speak about my father, I can't help but get a little bit sad because he doesn't see in the mirror what we see. Amen. Yeah. My father's not a weak man. But my father never was able, because of the way this system is built, to become the fullness of himself. And it's the reason that I do the work that I do. Because my father, who is the smartest man, the most hardest working man that I know, doesn't know it himself. And we cannot perpetuate that. Amen. It would hurt me to know that I was complicit a little bit in that by telling lies about my father, telling lies about our father. <coughs> Let's tell a new story. Yeah. Let's tell a new story. Let's elevate our people. Let's elevate the kings and the queens that we come from. <laughs> Our communities. 
We incarcerate more people today than were slaves at the height of slavery. Not, not, I, 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 I doubt that any of us can say that we don't know somebody who's on papers in prison. And so if we all see it, why well, won't say nothing about it? If we know it, why don't we do something about it? The system was built. It's not broken. It's working perfectly. And we can do something about it. We can get the we can police ourselves. We can bring in restorative justice in, a, in our communities. We can teach our young people about their Fourth Amendment right that protects them from unreasonable search and seizure. Amen. Most of our young people that go to jail, their number one crime is ignorance. You don't got to answer that question. All right, all right. You don't have to do what that officer tells you to do. Let's protect ourselves. Um, as I leave you all today, um, it, it really is not my hope that our paths cross again. I hope that our paths don't veer far from one another. I really feel at home in here. Anytime I'm in Oakland, I'm going to come to church here, and when I start getting a little bit of money, I'm going to pay some time. Um, and if you're ever in Florida, you got family there. If you're ever anywhere in that state, you got family there. I thank y'all for the opportunity to tell y'all a little bit about my father and our story. Um, and I hope that uh, it inspires somebody today, so thank you very much.